I have so many people who make me look good. One of them is seated right over there, my wife Susan. I do teach at Harding. I'm over at Harding almost all of the time, but she's out at Truth for the Day about all of the time, early in the morning, even until 5 o'clock in the evening. Sometimes she's up at 5, proofreading. But God has blessed us with other helpers too, and we have a wonderful team, we believe. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you for a few minutes. And the first question I want to raise is, what does the Great Commission say we are to do? The fullest account of the Great Commission would be Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the commandments that I've given to you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Our Lord Jesus, in his last Sermon on the Mount, that occasion whenever he gave the Great Commission, gave us three priorities. The first priority would be the priority of evangelism. He said, in essence, I have created the gospel by my death, and I have confirmed it by my resurrection, and now I'm giving it to you. And I want you, as my disciples, to see to it that you get it out to all the nations. Secondly, he gave us the priority of edification. He said, whenever you find somebody who wants to be a disciple, you baptize that person in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then you teach them all that I have commanded you. Thirdly, I believe he's given us the priority of equipping. You have to read pretty carefully here to see this, but it looks like to me it's implied. Our Lord says, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The implication would be that whenever I'm through and I lay the gauntlet down, I need to have somebody ready to pick it up. So that involves not only having somebody in line, but it involves making sure that they're ready, that they are prepared to pick it up. So here would be the three big priorities, evangelism, edification, equipping. They start with the letter E, so you can easily remember them. As our Lord gives us our mission, we want to make sure that we get it clearly fixed in our minds. You can go through life and not understand what your mission is. So we want to make sure that we've got that in our minds. But I'm going to go about this backwards. I want to talk about equipping first, and then we'll work our way back to the front of the Great Commission. If we have time, I'd like to say a word about edification, then a word about evangelism, as Truth For Today is trying to fulfill all of these parts of the Great Commission. Thank you so much for being willing to listen to me. First of all, we have the equipping idea. The old preachers would say the work of the evangelist is never done until the evangelized are evangelizing. We're not through with our work when we baptize somebody. We're not even through with our work whenever we've edified somebody. We must go to the third step, and that is make sure they're equipped where they can continue on with the work of evangelizing the world. Truth for Today is based in Searcy, Arkansas, but it's overseen by a congregation in Houston, Texas. They wanted to oversee it, and we thought it would be good if they did, be good for them, good for us. And so they started overseeing it at the very beginning, and they've been overseeing it ever since. Right now, we are mailing to about 33,000 men. They are scattered out in 146 nations of the world. Our world is really divided up into about 200 nations and territories, and we're in 146. I wish I could tell you we're in every nation. Maybe one of these days we'll be in every nation, but right now it's about 146. These are 33,000 men that are either preaching or they're trying to be a preacher. They're teaching or they're trying to be a teacher. They're in a school where they're being trained to teach or preach. 
but they are trying to do something more than just come to the assemblies. They're trying to be teachers or preachers, 33,000 of them. I teach at Harding University. We have a pretty good-sized university. But if you took all of our students at Harding University and coupled them with the students we have at Abilene, the students we have at Pepperdine, and you took those three groups and coupled them with the students we have at Oklahoma Christian University, and then you couple those four groups with the students that we have at Freed Hardman University, and you couple those four or five groups with the students that we have at David Lipscomb University, you wouldn't have 33,000. We're talking about a lot of people. And if we can equip these people to some degree where they can preach or teach in their own language to their own people, we've really done the right thing. It takes time and effort to do it. it. takes money to do it. it. takes a lot of dreaming to do it. But at least we're mailing to 33,000 of them potential and actual preachers and teachers in 146 nations of the world. Our hearts probably should skip a beat whenever somebody says, we're going into 146 nations. The missionaries shouldn't have to come to us and say, I'd like to go. We should be going to the missionaries and saying, how can we help? Our daughter and her husband are full-time missionaries in India. And every time we come out of India, we're saying to one another, how can we do more? Is there anything we can do to help them to be more effective in their work for the Lord? Now, if you put it on the world map, can you see this from where you're seated? What we have in the red would be places, at least where we have representation. Now, we're not saying that we have a lot of people in some of these areas. We have about 175 or so across Australia. You see, that's not a lot compared to the land area that's involved. But I'm just trying to show you that we've got somebody out there. And so we colored in in red. Now, if you're thinking about the uh, population of the earth, just the population of the earth, and uh, not the land area of the earth, but just the population of the earth, then we would be going out to about 80 to 85 percent of the populated land area of the earth. Well, that means that we're one of the biggest works that we have among us. I believe World Bible School would be going into more nations than we do, but we have uh, more material that we send to those that we're trying to encourage. We really believe in World Bible School, World English Institute, programs like that. We want to assist them. We don't want to denigrate them in any way. But I just wanted to show you the world map. We provide the uh, curriculum for about 100 of our overseas schools. If they know about us, they're asking for the material. We don't want to intrude. We don't want to uh, tell them what to do. But if they say, uh, we know about this material that you have available, we'd like to have it, we'd like to use it, here's how many copies we need, then we try to fulfill their request. Now, some of these preacher schools are not like the preacher schools that you know about here in the States. We've got one at Harding, and there are many others scattered throughout the United States. Uh, Bear Valley School of Preaching and uh, Sunset School of Preaching. They don't go by the designated Sunset anymore. But anyway, we've got a lot of good schools, but these are far more sophisticated than uh, many of the schools we have overseas. A school overseas might be, in some cases, uh, a man who has gotten together seven or eight men to study with him. Uh, he does not have the best education to lead a preacher school, but nevertheless, he's better than nothing. And if he has in his hands a curriculum that will help him to uh, guide his uh, students through a good portion of the Bible, that really helps him. And especially if he has enough material where he can put uh, portions of that material in their hands where they can read it as well as hear him discuss it, uh, that just adds even greater power to the uh, work that he's trying to do. But God bless all of these men. Uh, we want to help them. If there's anybody anywhere on earth who wants to be a preacher of the gospel or a teacher of the gospel, we want to help him. We want to encourage him. We need all the teachers we can get. We need all the preachers we can get. And you know why God puts you in America? 
He didn't put you here just so you can have a good time. He didn't put you here so you could just live in a good house and go to Walmart whenever you needed something. He didn't put you here for that. He put you here because he thought that you would make a difference in evangelizing the whole earth. He thought that you would take the blessings that you have that would be uh, probably far greater than anybody else in the world and use those to fulfill your mission. Your mission is the evangelization and edification and equipping of the whole world regarding the gospel of Christ. We've got to think deeply about this. I don't think that we always say it right. And you may disagree with me, but we will go to Matthew 25 for our mission. No, Matthew 25 is not about a mission. Matthew 25 is about your lifestyle. Jesus said, I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was in prison, but you did not visit me. I was naked, but you didn't clothe me. That's lifestyle. This is the kind of lifestyle you and I are to live. You don't go, though, to Matthew 25 to get your mission. You go to the Great Commission to get your mission. And the Great Commission says that your priority is to be the evangelization of the earth and the edification of the earth and the equipping of the earth. You may be a doctor, you may be a lawyer, you may be a school teacher, you may be a farmer. Those would be occupations. Your occupation is not your mission. I sure hope your occupation is not your mission. Your mission is found in the Great Commission. And whatever you do to make a living, you want to do that well enough where you can use a portion of that to fulfill your mission. That is, evangelizing the whole earth. God bless us as we try to do it. And may we do more and more. I wanted to come to the fact that we send these materials out in different languages. It's one thing to take a book like this and send it over the printer and say, reprint this. It's another thing to write it. We write these books every month if you include the translations. And we will publish about 12 or 13 different new books every month. But look at these languages. I'm just going to run through them right quickly. Chinese. We can take one book, translate it into Mandarin Chinese, and everybody in China, the largest people group on earth, can read it who is literate. That helps us in our evangelism. Indonesian, French, well, French is coming up later on. These that I have in red are Indian languages. Uh, India utilizes about 26 different languages. It's a divided country. Every state almost utilizes a different language. It's hard. It's hard to evangelize in India. You can't get a residence visa in India. Craig and Teresa are unable to get a residence visa. They come out of India every six months, renew their visa, and go back in. They live in India. They made the decision when they married that they would go to India and spend the rest of their life there. And they come back on furloughs every once in a while, but they sleep on the floor the way the Indians do. They don't have a car, just like the Indians. And they don't have a television. They are giving their hearts to the mission that God has given to them. Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, Punjabi, Canada, and uh, Marathi. Those are the languages that we are in in India. Now I just want to take a little aside here and show you. If you put those on the Indian map, this is the way it would look. What you see in the white, we're not going to those places. I wish that we had more people who are helping us with these languages where we could add Bengali, Nepali, and Urdu. We've got the translators, we think, standing by just as soon as we get the money to start translating and sending money, uh, sending materials in every month. But you see, uh, we're covering a lot of India. Never been done before. And if we uh, were able to get the funds for the other three languages and we had India covered, hot dogs, as I tell my students at Harding, hot dogs. That means 
This, we're doing something that's never been done before. This has never been done in the history of Christianity. Do you understand how significant this is? I mean, we're covering India. We pray about it. We think about it. But here's an opportunity to do it. And I mean, we're close. We're very close to doing it. We just need about three or four more languages put in place. And uh, all of this material would be going to uh, preachers or teachers who uh, do the work. Uh, Craig and Teresa, uh, they're not able to uh, do what these national men can do. But remember, India would be the second largest people group on earth. I mean, if you're interested in carrying out the Great Commission, it looks like we would be interested in going to where all the people are and make sure that we get those places covered as we continue in our work of evangelism. But I hope that I can come back maybe a year from now and tell you we've got all of these languages going. We'd like to add uh, not only Bengali, Nepali, Urdu, but Gujarati, and uh, Arija, did I leave one out, Susan? I think that that would be uh, what we want. We want to add Swahili for Africa. But you see, uh, this is important. It's very important for us to be in their languages. Now, you like English. I like English. But it's very important for us to provide materials in other languages. I mean, it's extremely important. And whenever Dayton went to one place, he told the elder just a few minutes ago in... Uh, right outside of Donetsk. Uh, they already had his uh, commentary on uh, Jeremiah in Russian, in their possession, and they were using it. Now that's good. That's what we like to hear, that they're getting it, they're using it, it's in their language, the language they love. You love English, they love their own language. And we must translate materials into their language and really do it well. Anyway, here are a few more, French, Spanish, Russian, Portuguese, Arabic, we're the only ones in our brotherhood who have an Arabic translation center uh, where we're translating material into uh, print every month. Those are the languages, and we need to add more. But here's one of the pictures that maybe I could leave with you, and that would be, I've got 12 on here. We really have 13, I think, uh, about 13 going out. But these are the books that we publish every month. We publish uh, 12 to 13 new books every month. Sometimes we send them out two at a time. Sometimes we send them out three at a time. But it's the equivalent of, of a new book every month. Now that, that's good. Uh, that's what we really need to do. Uh, the languages are not inexpensive. Uh, they are, they're, it's tough. But you can figure it out. A language costs $23,000 a year for all of the printing, for all of the translation, and the mailing. Uh, that's all that includes. And uh, that means that as we send out 5000 a month, uh, they're costing us about $0.65 cents a piece. But uh, we want to send out at least 5000 a month because by the time you get the translators together and you get this going, you want to send out a lot of material. You don't want to send out just two or three hundred pieces, but you want to really try to cover some areas and make a difference in that part of the world. But every time we send a book out, we've raised the literary, the, uh, literary level, spiritual literary level of that country. And I think we really ought to do it. A young couple came up to me not too long ago, and they said, just as soon as we retire... We're going to take care of a language. I said, well, that's wonderful. Now listen to me, brethren. Whenever you retire, you know what you're retiring for? You're retiring so that you can work now fully for the Lord. That's what you're doing. And you say, well, what I want to do is buy my farm and go out and take it easy. Spend a lot of time deer hunting. No, what you want to do is keep on working, but this time... Since you uh, have already got your retirement in place and everything set aside, what you make, use it to evangelize the earth. If we had a few people to rise up like that, what a difference they could make. In the whole earth. You don't believe this, but there you sat this morning. And uh, you can make a difference in the whole world if you'll think about it. If you'll get down on your knees and pray about it, God will give you some way 
where you can make a difference in the whole world. I wish that you would uh, put your heart on us and see if you couldn't help us do it. This is our commentary series. Dayton has written two of them. Uh, the work on uh, Jeremiah, Dayton did. We really believe we need uh, a preacher school, uh, at least uh, that could be used overseas, that's inexpensive. And that is portable. We can put it anywhere we need it. And uh, is, uh, that has depth to it. So we have taken the commentary series and we have built a reading-based school of biblical studies around it. And I wanted to tell you the story of this. Uh, when we were in India uh, about two years ago, this is our daughter and her husband and Anna and Jay. But Craig came to me and he said, now, we need a school. We've established all these churches. We've got a number of preaching brethren and they don't get any support from the states. They're trying to uh, be indigenous. And I said, well, why don't you try our reading-based School of Biblical Studies? So he put together a meal, invited men from all over Mumbai to come. Remember, Mumbai is the fifth largest city on earth. And it has about uh, 20 million in population. I counted it up. And it looks like they have about three times the population of Arkansas. It's a big city. No telling how long it is. Not too wide, but it goes for 75 miles. I want to be accurate about this, so this is roughly how long it is. Just people, people, people. Anyway, he said, we need a school. And I said, I'll tell the men about it. So he gathered them together, and I told them, nobody's going to be paid for this. If you want to have a school, I recommend that you appoint a dean and appoint a board, and nobody will be paid for it. Set it up. We will provide the books for you free of charge. They will be your scholarship, but uh, you got to make C's or above to get the scholarship. Anyway, they set it up, and I mean they've really been doing well with it. They have a year behind them. When we went over uh, just recently, we try to go every time we can, but we went over there recently and were there during Christmas. They don't really observe Christmas over there. They don't have any lights up or any trees anywhere, you know. It's just a plain time of the year. And it's hot. You just don't even know Christmas has come and gone. But anyway, we were over there and they were so excited about having completed their first year of studies. And they spent a whole day. A whole day rejoicing at having been privileged to go through these commentaries for an entire year. About a year before that, maybe two years before that, I went over to the school and gave a lecture or two on um, Matthew 24, uh, the fall of Jerusalem. And uh, it, was, it was a wonderful time. I mean, these are fine men. Uh, these men are businessmen, they're, they're indigenous, they're providing their own way as they preach and teach. They're really good men. Now one man, excuse me for turning my back on you here, but Craig is in the corner over here, that's our son-in-law. And then just above him in the white shirt would be uh, uh, another American missionary. But if you eliminate those two, then uh, of course you have the actual preacher school. We've got 27 of these going right now in different places around the world. We need them all over the earth. I want to show you something else before my time gets away from me. I told the elders about this. Plans are being made for a Bible university, an online Bible university. We don't have it online yet, so don't run home and look this up. We don't have it online yet. But we hope we'll have the beginning part of it online in uh, May. Uh, from one language to several. We may eventually, whenever it comes out in its fullness, will be in 12 different languages where anybody anywhere in the world who's attached to Internet can come online and they can enroll and we'll begin to take them through these commentaries that we have. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to finish the commentary set where one day they'll be able to go through the whole Bible. I want to tell you something. 
Very few people on earth have gone through the whole Bible, studied through the whole Bible. I know there are many people who have read through it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about studying through the whole Bible. Very few people have done that. And for the first time in our history, uh, since the day of Pentecost, we're going to be able to provide for the whole world, global coverage, an opportunity to actually go through the Bible with very, very good teaching. And if you haven't seen Dayton's two commentaries on Jeremiah, you, you need to get that set. And one way you could help us is just to buy a set of these and put them in your home. It costs you a little bit. They're $26 a piece. I've got a set with me, in fact. Uh, save you the postage. You don't have to pay any tax over here in Oklahoma. Did you know that? Anyway, uh, you need to put this in your home. Leave it for your children. Leave it for your grandchildren. We need a very responsible commentary set that covers the whole Bible that people can study through and learn what God has actually said to us. Bible coverage and depth in ability. How much time do I have? Wonderful, wonderful. Second part. I'm going to the second part of the Great Commission as we work our way back to the front. We provide a lot of edification. Our brotherhood does not have many works that provide edification. Now, we'll lead you to Christ. We will provide a way for you to understand the plan of salvation, but we don't have any edification beyond the plan of salvation. We depend upon the local missionaries to do that or national preachers to do that. And we've got quite a few of them, but we don't have enough to reach out to seven billion on earth. So we really believe this is a very important part of our work. Now just to suppose that you were a member of this congregation. I'm talking about this one that I've got on the slide. You either bring your own pew or you sit on the ground or sit on a rock. And you're not going to have multiple cups when you observe the Lord's Supper. Forget that. There'll be one cup going down this way, one cup going down this way. And whenever it's time to sing the songs, no song books. The brother who's leading the singing will probably hum his way through the first stanza so you'll get the tune. And then he might sing his way through the first stanza so you'll get the words. And then you'll sing from memory. And the brother who's going to do the preaching, you know, you're spoiled. You have a good preacher and you get to listen to good preaching, if you were in this congregation, there'd be just a brother in the congregation who would take you through a chapter to the best of his ability. And that would be your Bible class as well as your worship. And you'd pray, give, just like we do here. But what do they need? Really, what do they need? Well, you know how we are. Well, we'll take up a contribution. We'll help them build a building. That's not their first need. Leave them alone. Let them provide their own building. And if they want to meet out under a tree, let them do it. They don't need a building like you've got. They wouldn't know what to do with it. We'll also say, well, we need to send them some money. Don't send them any money. Watch it. They're getting along without money. And God bless them. We're going to settle everything with money. But God says, let me tell you how I'm going to settle it. I'm going to settle it with my Bible. I want them to know my word. That's their biggest need. They need somebody to teach them the Bible. They need to know about Revelation. They need to know about Jeremiah. They need to know about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They need to understand Romans. They need to understand 1 Corinthians and Hebrews. They need to understand all of it, just like you and I do. Their biggest need is edification. When will we learn it? When will we understand it? We've got to know the Bible. You have to know the Bible. If you are not studying the Bible right here in this congregation, you're missing the boat. You need to know the Bible. There's no way that you can rear your family properly unless you know the Bible. And there's no way that you can make decisions about what you should do in this community unless you know the Bible. Well, in Brazil, here's a single mother. Who's going to help her? How's she going to do it? Trying to teacher boy. Well, the minister has come, and he has brought one of our books in Portuguese, and 
she's going through that and then he'll leave her the book and she'll study it on her own but that's the way it's done I'm hurrying let's come to our evangelism part uh, we're reaching out to those who have never heard the gospel at least trying to and uh, we use this book right here you've probably seen it now in the African version it's entitled becoming a faithful Christian they don't mind that title but this is the edition for the American reader you know we were afraid they might be allergic to a title like how to become a faithful Christian so we entitled it into the abundant life a little more palatable we thought anyway we can print it it's 512 pages it has a New Testament in it a complete New Testament in it and it has about 300 pages on how you become a Christian how you live as a Christian we give them a recipe for unleavened bread we try to take them from A to Z on how to become a Christian how to live as a Christian it's really a wonderful book 512 pages long doesn't look like it we've used the thin paper but if we uh, publish uh, print around uh, 50,000 at a time we can get the cost down to 97 cents and then it'll take us about 52 cents to get it out to the reader but we will work through the national preacher he will take it and give it to people around him and uh, that's his method of evangelism he'll give somebody this book and say read this and they'll read a portion of it he comes back to see them and they've understood at least a little bit about how to become a Christian and, and then he touches it up a little bit and then they become Christians. I have a friend, in fact he is also one of the elders of the college church who lives two doors down from us. His name is David Duke. David Duke is a doctor. He's the son-in-law of Clifton L. Gaines. Clifton L. Gaines, who has been our chancellor for the last hundred years, He's been our chancellor for several years. He's now 91. He decides, he has decided recently he was going to retire. He figured that, you know, it was time. But anyway, he's a wonderful man. Cliff Nell Gaines keeps his suitcase packed. And whenever he has a little bit of time, he takes off to Africa. Even at 91, he'd just gotten back from Africa. Well, that has sort of uh, resided in the heart of Richard Duke as well and He'll take off to Africa and try to go to some place way up north where the gospel has never gone. And he went to one village way up north and he was talking to them and they said, uh, well, we know about Jesus. He said, you do? Uh, they said, yes, we have a church here. What kind of church? They said, we have a church of Christ and we've even built our own building. Really? He said, well, I want to see your building. So they took him over to show him the building. Now remember buildings overseas don't have anything inside them they don't have any chairs inside them you bring your own chair chairs are so special that you bring it every Sunday bring your own chair set it up anyway they took him over to this building it was made out of sticks and stone but at least it was a building that they were proud of and they could use he got inside and he looked over at uh, you know how it was set up and he did see a table uh, maybe they used it for the observance of the Lord's Supper. And he just ambled over there to see what they had on that table to see what they were using. And lo and behold, here's what he saw. They had gotten a copy of our book, How to Become a Faithful Christian in Africa. We managed to put 600,000 in sub-Sahara Africa. And uh, they got one of them. We don't even know how they got it. But they read it. When you don't have anything, you use well what you do have. You and I have so much, we don't use anything well. But they took that one book, and they read it and read it and read it. And here's proof of it. The cover's gone. We had a letter on the first page. When you open it up, there'd be a letter from us saying, now here's what this is, and here's what you need to do with it. But the letter's gone. The cover's gone. But there's a little congregation of maybe uh, 10 to 15. All around the world, there are people who need the gospel. And God has put us here in America where we have our cars, our houses, and all of these appliances and everything else. And everybody here can do something more. Not a person here who can't help out. I hope you will. I hope you'll try to help us. 
I don't want you to take anything away from your regular contribution. I didn't come from that for that. But I want you to try to do something. This very day, I want you to try to do something to evangelize this world. Listen to what our Savior said. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the commandments that I've given to you. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. God bless you. If you want to see some of our materials, you come to me. The set of the commentaries, I think it's almost a set, would be uh, back in the foyer where you can go peruse through that. We brought several of our issues that we'll be glad to give you on Christ's death, burial, and resurrection because that was the theme of the workshop. It's not normally the way we do this, but here would be the addition on the Minor Prophets, Nahum and Habakkuk. Uh, that's normally what we do. The exposition of Scripture just crosses the cultures better. You know, in every culture of the world, uh, we've got, if we translate into their language, we can adapt it some through that translation center and make it more readable for them. But God bless you. I think my time is up. Is that right? Two minutes. Two minutes. Do, is there a question I could answer? Maybe there's something that you wanted to know about that I didn't cover you feel free to speak up. If you wanted to make out a check to the work of Truth for Today, you would just make it out Truth for Today. I know we ought to have in there Truth for Today, parentheses open, and eternity, parentheses closed. But we just got Truth for Today, and we would love for you to help us if you can. Have any questions for me? All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Dayton. You know what that means. <laughs> Eddie was just mentioning to us a moment ago and then we met the elders with him. When these 40 volumes have been finished, they are going to be available to anyone on the Internet on the earth. They could download it uh, and it's not a charge. Now I think there may be there uh, is some minor fee but it's about like getting a whole copy of the Bible on a DVD or something like that for a dollar and a half or anyhow that basket is back there and if any of you want to help out we'll try to kind of guard it so no one will take anything out of the basket <laughs> except Eddie and uh, or if you want to write a check as he said just make it out for truth for today and they'll be able to take care of it there. Appreciate the interest that many of you have shown at varied times incidentally Eddie about two or three four times a year we have a special contribution for different parts of special needs and uh, this is certainly I think about as cost effective if you want to put it down into economics as anything brethren are doing today because these dollars really do move out into so many different places and languages every time funds flow into that. Eddie mentioned that uh, he doesn't even have a salary for truth for today. He gets a little bit from Harding University for teaching Bible over there and other subjects, but uh, this is operating in a beautiful way and with some capable people helping in so many places. If you help here, you are immediately beginning to help scatter different parts of the earth. You are now dismissed. If any of you want to go back there now, you could uh, help out some way. <laughs>